Tonight on Capitol Journal, a new statue is unveiled at Tuskegee University marking the Polio Eradication Project. We'll take you there and speak with Graham Champion, who helped organize the event. Randy Scott reports on how COVID and monkeypox continue to strain the state's medical community. State Treasurer Young Boozer discusses the state's financial situation and explains how historic inflation came about. And political columnist Steve Flowers offers his analysis on this election cycle and walks us down memory lane with stories from the old days of Alabama politics. It's all next on Capital Journal. From our State House studio in Montgomery, I'm Todd Stacy. Welcome to Capital Journal. Federal officials visited Alabama this week to tour desolate and unsanitary sewage conditions in Lowndes County. The heads of the Environmental Protection Agency and the U.S. Department of Agriculture came to Hainville to announce a pilot program to help rural communities that face serious sewage problems. Led by Congresswoman Terry Sewell, the officials visited homes with sewage running into the yard and pulling up in open holes on the ground. The pilot program will aim to help communities like Hainville assess their sewage problems, plan improvements, and receive the financial and technical help needed to make those plans real. Of course, the Alabama legislature dedicated more than $225 million in American Rescue Plan Act funds toward addressing water and sewer needs in the state. That's on top of $765 million coming into Alabama from the bipartisan infrastructure law passed by Congress last year. The influx of funds for water and sewer projects has put historic demand on the Alabama Department of Environmental Management, which is charged with administering the funds and approving the projects. This year alone, local water systems have applied for more than $3.1 billion for nearly 600 water and sewer projects. As of this week, about $188 million in drinking water projects and $98 million in clean water projects had been approved, according to ADEM. Among the approved projects are $41 million for a wastewater project in Mobile, $39 million for water line improvement in Birmingham, a $15 million water project in Florence, a $14 million project in Scottsboro, multiple projects in Tuscaloosa County, totaling more than $22 million, and $10 million for sewer work there in Hainville. ADEM Director Lance LaFleur says the scope of this challenge is daunting, but that Alabamians can expect to see hundreds of water and sewer projects throughout the state over the next three to four years. A new monument was unveiled this week at Tuskegee University, marking the Institute's key role in the eradication of polio. The Polio Recognition Project, a years-long effort to document and celebrate the historic research conducted at Tuskegee, culminated in a special program and statue dedication. The monument consists of life-size bronze statues depicting Dr. John Chenault, Nurse Warina A. Turpin, and patient Gordon Stewart. Others involved in Tuskegee's Infantile Paralysis Center are recognized on the granite panel at the base of the statue. State Representative Peblin Warren said the project highlights Tuskegee's key role in eradicating polio in the United States. It's, it's, it's another day in history as we spread our legacy at Tuskegee University and the great, great work because it was really, today was an educational experience for me because I learned so much. I had no idea that we had all this great medical history here at Tuskegee University, a university that does not offer a medical degree. Uh, just to look at all the research and things that was done and, 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 and to really think back on the necessity of what was going on then because black folks had no other choices. They had no other place to go. And listening to um, the judge speaking today about his personal experience with polio and being here at Tuskegee, it just, it's, it's something really special. It, it stood out today as a very, very special day. And I just want to thank the uh, Rotary 680, 6880 for their time and commitment and resources. And I also want to give a special thanks to the state of Alabama, to my colleagues, because they 
readily joined in to give us the financial support we needed to get this bill. So I just want to say thank you to all my legislative colleagues because, again, this is just building history and promoting the state of Alabama. The project was sponsored in part by Rotary International. I'll speak with Graham Champion of the Rotary Club later in the show. Chief Justice Tom Parker was hospitalized earlier this week, but is now back home and recovering. The head of Alabama's judicial branch told Alabama Daily News that he had a health matter that required hospitalization, but he did not offer specifics. The Chief Justice says he is recovering well and expects to be back at work at the court next week. Parker was first elected to the Supreme Court in 2014 and elected Chief Justice in 2018. He is 71 years old and cannot seek another term as Chief Justice under an Alabama law that only allows those under 70 to run for judicial positions. We certainly wish the Chief Justice a full recovery. Medical personnel have seen their responsibilities double and even triple since the COVID-19 outbreak. Now, new issues are confronting an already busy and exhausted workforce. Capital Journal's Randy Scott reports. For hospitals and agencies, including Health Services Incorporated, it's a busy time, but not business as usual. Primary care for pediatric and adults. We provide dental, optometry, OB, behavioral health services. We have case management, we have WIC, we have a lot of services. Ebony Evans is the marketing director for HSI and says their workload has skyrocketed thanks to COVID-19. Then reports of polio started. We've been informed we have um, an infection control team who constantly meets to talk about polio, to talk about COVID and all other infectious diseases. And so we haven't had a case in any one of our clinics up front, but we are prepared. Health Services Incorporated consists of 15 facilities covering a six county area in central Alabama. Helping people stay healthy is what they do. So imagine how complicated it got when COVID-19 invaded this area. Now add to it the threat of polio and monkeypox. And officials here say both their jobs and concerns have increased. And we really do try to push that, hey, it, we're not out of the woods at all. It's still important to be vaccinated. We're still giving out first and second shots for those members who have not been vaccinated. Now health officials face a new challenge, the monkeypox virus. So we haven't had it at our doors. I know there are a few cases um, in the state of Alabama. However, for our organization, we continue to push with the monkeypox. The same precautions go with COVID and the same precautions go with polio. Evans says during tough times, they have a weapon at their disposal, education. And I know we miss congregating with our families, with our friends and having a good time, but it's just not time yet, especially with those other looming factors like polio and the, the chicken po monkeypox coming out. The, it's just not time for us to let our guards down. For Capital Journal, I'm Randy Scott. A federal oversight board has ordered the United Mine Workers of America to pay more than $13 million in compensation to an Alabama coal company where members have been on strike for more than a year. The National Labor Relations Board says that Warrior Met Coal Mining was due some $13.3 million for costs, including increased security, damage repair, and lost revenues from unmined coal. The union is striking at Warrior Met Coal's number four and number seven mines, also a preparation plant and a central shop, all located in Tuscaloosa County. The union and the company reached an agreement to end the walkout a few days after it began, but members later rebuffed that settlement. College football is right around the corner, and the biggest off-season issue this year has been the new name, image, and likeness rules that allow players to earn money on branding themselves. Many prominent coaches, including Alabama's Nick Saban, have expressed concern about how the new rules might impact the future of the game. This week, Senator Tommy Tuberville said he was working with Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia on federal legislation that would set clear ground rules for the proliferation of NIL. Tuberville, of course, coached at Auburn for 10 seasons, and Manchin happens to be lifelong friends with Saban. The senators said their goals were simple, to protect student athletes, and fair, f ensure fair competition and compensation, and to preserve the time-honored traditions of college sports. We'll be right back with tonight's guests. 
You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. Keep up with what's happening with Capital Journal. Next, I'm joined by State Treasurer Young Boozer. Mr. Boozer, thanks again for coming on Capital Journal. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now, you are uh, known as the state's banker. You manage a lot of different pots of money. Can you kind of give us an overview of, of all the money that you're managing right now? Uh, sure, be happy to. Uh, let me just start with um, the state's money. Okay. And we call that the treasury fund. And, uh, and let me give you a little history about this. It's because I've been the treasurer before. Uh, when I was elected and was started to serve in January of 2011, that uh, treasury fund was about $2.4 billion. At the end of my two terms, eight years later, when I left office in January of uh, 2019, that amount of money had grown to $3.6 billion. Wow. So it was up 50% over an eight year period. And if you recall what those time periods were, is we were just coming out of the Great Recession, the economy was recovering, and to increase that cash because of the growth in revenues and, uh, uh, and managing expenses, uh, we had grown that to $3.6 billion, so it makes sense. Here's something that surprised me when I came back. So I came back three years later, and um, that $3.6 billion, and I'll give you a number as of today, this morning. Okay. It has grown to $10.6 billion. Wow, in, in how many years? Three years. Wow. It is, I've got to imagine a lot of that's this federal money. That's it's, coming. Uh, for the most part, it's all federal money. Now, the state's doing well. So if you're talking about what's happening, uh, the underlying economy in the state of Alabama is good, and that has uh, been good for state tax revenues. But on top of that is all of this federal money that has poured in over the last uh, two and a half, three years. Uh, and it, the amount is really remarkable. And the other thing is, is that uh, when we... Um, when I came back in October, uh, I asked uh, the department to produce a, uh, a chart for me on a daily basis that would say, this is how much money we have outstanding, this is where it's invested, here are the interest rates, and what is the projected 12-month income on that money, and what could the state expect over a 12-month period, all things being equal. Hmm. So when they did that calculation in October, that number was $22 million. That report that I talked about today, mm -hmm. that number is now $180 million. So that's the return that we're getting? That is the projected in interest income that we would get on the investments that we have as of that day. I was going to ask you about that because this money doesn't just sit in the bank, right? You're, you're, oh, no. you're, you're putting it places to where we can get some return. Uh, uh, no question about it. We're, we are um, prudent uh, and aggressive investors uh, on the short term uh, uh, in the short-term market. So uh, some of it is in a checking account because we have to maintain balances for all of the uh, transactions that the state uh, uh, transacts with the banks. Uh, but is, uh, we keep that to a minimum. And then anything above that we put into uh, money market mutual funds, uh, commercial paper, uh, short-term investments in uh, U.S. securities, two years and less, that kind of investment. So, uh, and of course what's happened over the uh, last months is that uh, interest rates have risen pretty dramatically. They've gone from virtually zero uh, on a Fed funds basis to 2.5%. We had some uh, accounts that were paying us three basis points in October. And now those accounts are paying us 2 to 2.5%. Two that is a huge incremental amount. So uh, yes, it's uh, interest rates rising. It's tough on borrowers. But if you're a lender or an investor like we are, uh, it's been terrific for us, and it's going to add a lot to the general fund. Hmm. Well, oh, and let me say this: yeah. we're not alone. So we're one state of uh, 50. Th uh, this exact same thing is happening in every state because of these federal funds are going. Yeah. Yes, and so um, 
there's an incredible amount of money out there. Uh, it's all being invested uh, relatively short term because the money that we got from the federal uh, government has to be spent in the next three to five years. So it has to be uh, relatively liquid uh, to be available to uh, make those payments to whatever those projects are going to be. Well, it sounds like the state's finances are healthy at the moment, is, is what it sounds like to me. Uh, the, the, uh, the state of Alabama is uh, financially healthy right now. That's good to know. Well, speaking of that, while, while we're on that subject, um, you also manage the Alabama Trust Fund. This is, you know, was established, I guess, back in the 90s with the oil and gas revenues and everything. Uh, actually, uh, uh, gas was discovered in the late 70s. Okay. And the trust was set up in the early 80s. I see. By uh, Bob James. Right. And uh, since then, uh, all of the royalties that come in off of the uh, natural gas sales uh, go to that fund. And we invest it, and, uh, and we also distribute it to um, the designated uh, recipients. I know that the legislature, because they had so much revenue this year, um, dedicated some, you know, some paybacks, basically, to try to shore up the Alabama Trust Fund. Where does it sit right now? Okay. Um, well, uh, let, me, let me go back in history. Okay. Uh, the Alabama Trust Fund was kind of a piggy bank for legislatures in the past. And when they needed to uh, plug holes in the budget or when they needed to cover uh, shortfalls at the end of the year, they would dip into it and uh, pull money out and uh, put it into the budget. Uh, with uh, Amendment uh, 856, uh, Senator Orr and I stopped that. Uh, we totally restructured it. We restructured it for the 21st century so that, um, that those revenues come into the trust. Uh, it is managed uh, in a very professional way. We've got a great board, we've got uh, great advisors, and we've had uh, terrific performance uh, over that time period. The other thing that was real important that we did, we put in a spending policy. Before, it was uh, sort of haphazard and guesswork as to uh, what was going to be budgeted to come out of the uh, Alabama Trust Fund to the general fund. Uh, we basically put in a spending policy that says this is the formula by which you distribute money going forward. Uh, and we did it uh, in a way that instead of guessing at what it was going to be tomorrow, uh, we can project two years in advance how much money that will pay out to uh, the general fund, uh, the cities, the counties, uh, Forever Wild, and senior services. So this last, well this year, uh, fiscal year 2022, we are going to be paying out about $175 million to uh, to all of those entities, uh, and about 120, 125 will go to the general fund. Now, the interesting thing about that is we know what that is. We knew what it was two years ago, and there was there were times in the early 2000s where uh, that number was anywhere from 40 to 50 to 120 million dollars. They just really couldn't project it, and they couldn't count on it. Mm -hmm. We wanted it to be uh, dependable. So uh, the general fund got 120, 125 million this year. Uh, cities and counties got 17 million each. Uh, Forever Wild got 15 million, and uh, Senior Services got about two million dollars. And we know where it's coming from, and we can count on it. Yeah, it makes it easier to budget if you. You're, oh my gosh, <laughs> it's incredibly easy to budget. Sure. Now it is. Um, Y'all had big news this past week on the pact. Fund. And this is the prepaid Alabama college tuition fund. Yeah. Uh, kind of been <laughs> riddled with problems, <laughs> dec you know, many years ago. So tell us what happened. Well, uh, it ran into financial difficulty uh, back in uh, 2009 and 10 uh, at the end of the Great Recession. And, and the reason it ran into trouble was because in the last 10 years before it was shut down, it was closed in uh, 2008, in the last 10 years, uh, Tuition went up 10% a year on average, and we ran into two downturns on the stock market. And if you looked at the return over that 10-year period for that, it was only 5%. Hmm. So there was a 5% gap per year for 10 years. Well, that's a, that's a hole you can't dig out of. So we uh, came in in uh, 2011. Uh, we looked at uh, what the structure was, what assets that we had. We had the investments remaining in the program, and then uh, the legislature had approved $548 million to be paid into the program over a 13-year period. And that uh, began in 2015, and it was going to run to 2027. And it was all kinds of different amounts. And I won't get into why it was that way, but it was kind of crazy. Uh, and what we did, we said, we're going to have to structure something to use those assets and that stream of income 
get together with the actuary and say, if this is what we have, and we have 40,000 contracts still out there, how do we spread this money that's fair and reasonable to these folks? We had three objectives. One was to make sure everybody got paid, mm -hmm. because uh, that's what they uh, signed up for. They would get good value, and uh, that is, has happened and will happen, and that there'll be enough money so that the last student in 2032 or thereabouts will be able to get tuition. And we will be able to do that for, this, for these two reasons. Uh, on May the 2nd, a couple of weeks before our board meeting, uh, we were prepaid $177 million, which is that we're gonna pay off the debts concept. So we received that. And uh, we also got a, an $8 million payment, which was the final annual payment from uh, the ETF. So the ETF sent that money to us. So 177 and $8 million, which fully funds the PAC program from the monies that ETF was gonna give us. In that situation, what we're able to do is uh, do the numbers, run the calculations so that we could provide full tuition this fall semester for the participants in the program today. Uh, at, um, at the end of last year, there were seven schools that were uh, not yet at full tuition because what's happened over these years is we made eight consecutive increases in payouts ranging from three to 10%. And it has gotten us to a point where now that we're fully funded, we have the cash. We didn't have to worry about not being able to get the cash later on. Uh, we have the cash, we can now get to that point. So uh, when uh, school starts uh, later on this month, uh, we'll, be, uh, uh, we'll be at full tuition for all schools, unfortunately, except for uh, University of South Alabama, and they're real close. Okay. So, um, well, I know a lot of people are, are going to be happy to hear that. I remember the frustration because, you know, you sign up for this program. It's, it's supposed to be guaranteed by the government. And come on. It's, and there were a lot of frustrated parents uh, out there. And I, I know that this will be welcome news. Uh, uh, there's no question there were. I, I heard from a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> I, got a lot, I got a lot of phone calls. My co phone was radioactive for several weeks. But uh, and you have to understand is that uh, they had contracts with the program not with the state of Alabama. Okay. And when that class action lawsuit was settled, we reached a settlement agreement where they became members of the settlement agreement. And they are bound by the terms and conditions, which basically said, we're gonna start back with the 2010 rates and then we're gonna increase them as, as we can over time, which we've done. Uh, and the interesting thing is, is that that is how we're operating and that's how we will operate in the future. And I just want to point out that uh, we have total assets of about $250 million. And if we uh, uh, do some calculations, if, it, if uh, tuition doesn't take off like it did before, uh, it's likely that we'll have some money left over. And that money, according to the, uh, to the settlement agreement, no question about this, is it's in writing. Uh, Judge Hardwick approved it and the Supreme Court uh, confirmed it. Uh, that money goes back to the ETF. And that makes sense because they're the ones who put in the $548 million in order to save the program. And um, it, it goes back to the taxpayers because it's, the ETF is income tax and sales tax. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to the ETF as rightly it should. We could have a whole different conversation about tuition, but we'll, we'll, we'll move on. <laughs> oh, yeah, tell me about it. Uh, um, unclaimed property. I know this is an interesting function of your office. Uh, tell me about unclaimed property and, and y'all's role in this. Okay, we, we operate unclaimed property. Uh, when I got this job as treasurer, I had done everything that the treasurer of the state of Alabama does today in my private life. I'd never done this. Okay. Never done unclaimed property. And, and so the thing is, is that uh, you're a student at Auburn. Uh, you have a checking account. You have $100 in it. You get a job in Huntsville. You move to Huntsville. You forget about the checking account in the Auburn Bank. Okay, so there's $100 just sitting there. Just sitting there. After three years, if you have no transactions, if there's no contact, uh, what that bank has got to do is you've got to turn that $100 over to the state of Alabama, and I, I try to find you from okay. forever. It never goes away. Your name's always there. It's always 100 bucks. And um, it is, uh, we see all kinds of stuff. We currently have unclaimed property in the amount of one point one billion dollars. Wow. 
It represents about 9 million individual claims. If you do the math quickly, it's 125 bucks on average. But uh, it could be $1.98 from a dividend check that you didn't cash, or it could be an estate that gets turned over that uh, people couldn't find the uh, beneficiaries. Uh, just this last week, a very, very famous person uh, showed up on the unclaimed property uh, list uh, for an amount, let me say it's in excess of five figures. Okay. Going to want that back. Uh, and made the claim, and, uh, the, and, and the check is on his way. So, but here's what I would do. Uh, you don't have to be a famous person to check. If you want to check right now, I would tell your viewers, mm -hmm. go to the treasurer's website, Treasury dot alabama spelled out dot gov okay we'll put a little link put, put a thing on there uh, and so you go to that yeah you, uh, you go to it, and there's a button on the uh, home page hit unclaimed property it'll take you to uh, another page and you put in your name and your town you don't have to put too much more than that hit hit uh, research and request and it'll pop up if you've got unclaimed property so you can check, and if you do have something, you can just keep working on the on the website and make a claim uh, all, uh, over the internet and uh, get your money back. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go get my hundred bucks from Auburn. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. That'd be great. Well, I've I, got I you. would say this though: nothing gives us more satisfaction than reuniting people with their own money. Well, that's nice. They I, always I, smile. I'm sure they like it too. They do. While I've got you here, just there's so much going on economically. Uh, nationwide and here in Alabama. I want to talk about inflation. This has just you know, been the, the watchword of the year. Um, it's frustrating for families that go to the grocery store or really buy anything. Mm -hmm. It's frustrating for the state and governments that are trying to build things and, and manage money. Um, could you just kind of give us a, a short explanation of how we got to here and, and what caused this inflation and, and maybe what's like, how likely uh, long it's going to last? Okay. Um, Milton Friedman, a famous economist from the Chicago School, has the greatest definition of inflation, and it's too many dollars chasing too few goods. What we talked about at the very beginning of this uh, uh, interview was how much money I have on hand, mm -hmm. and that money I have on hand is going to be used to build things according to ARPA and the other laws that have been passed. We're talking about, I've got $7 billion that is probably uh, uh, positioned to make those payments. There are 49 other states that are in the same thing. And you know what they're all going to build? Broadband, water and sewer. Water and sewer, roads. You yeah. Roads, you yeah. name it, right? They're all going to buy it. So what happens is, is when you have that kind of money and that kind of requirement to spend that money, the demand is huge. The supply for steel, concrete, asphalt, engineers, uh, road graders, whatever it happens to be, is limited. So what happens is, is that uh, you get a situation where too many dollars chasing too few goods causes inflation. Uh, but that's, that's kind of the, um, the simple way to look at it. So how did we get to where we are right now? There was a point in time not too long ago where uh, inflation was low, the economy was good, moving along. Um, I, and we talked about this a little bit earlier. I, I say there's six things that have happened. I won't get into the details on this, but uh, the first one was COVID itself. When somebody says there's a pandemic, people start changing the way they live in all kinds of ways. Then what happens is, is that there's a lockdown by government to uh, help control uh, the pandemic. Then what happens is that governments all around the world decide, you know what, we got to help our people, and they do. So they make payments to them. So a tremendous amount of cash flows into uh, the state, the city, the county, but also in the individual's hands. Uh, then you, uh, to go in a different angle, uh, you got a new administration who decides we're going to change uh, the policy on fossil fuels. And fossil fuels, uh, in uh, once again, supply and demand. If you say, I am going to change that, uh, that formula, I'm going to make oil and gas, gasoline, all these things, much more expensive, and uh, they have done that. The other thing is there are a lot of progressive policies that are out there that uh, cause uh, some of these uh, bills to be uh, passed and the money to flow to us. That's another uh, situation where you've got cash flowing in that's got to be spent later on. And then the last thing, uh, I think which tops it all off and nobody really would have expected, is, uh, as I call it, Crimea 2.0, which is the invasion by Russia into the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And that uh, 
that's a whole new uh, factor that is a global factor that just uh, sort of tops it off. It's a, it's a strange uh, set of uh, events that followed one by one. Well, that, I appreciate that explanation. And, you know, what we're seeing now, though, um, on, the, on the political front, in Washington, in Congress, because I remember, you go back to the, the first, you know, CARES Act that was under mm -hmm. the Trump administration and I guess at least the Republican Senate, um, and lots of money spent, then came the ARPA, and just trillions really spent. <laughs> but I know the way politics works. Yeah. It's hard to turn off the spigot. The first one that says, no, 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 we're going to cut back. We're, not, we're going to spend less money. Well, then you get accused on political ads of, well, you've cut you know, benefits, or you've cut this or that. So, so there, there are like built-in political incentives to really never stop spending, but it sounds like you know, this, you know, that the, the so, continuous flow of funds is, is helping fuel this. Uh, you're absolutely right. And so uh, what, how does the reaction change? The reaction changes when uh, it costs me 200 bucks to fill up my pickup truck, right? Then that's what brings it down to the people. Uh, and I think, um, uh, well, um, how do we get out of this? Well, that's what I was going to ask you. So, all right, you, you get that there's, there's political incentives, and there's, yeah. there's, there's always been the case. Nobody wants to be the one cutting sure. health care or cutting you know, any kind of thing. No politician does. But when you run into inflation like this and it's hurting everybody, do you think that has a chance to change the political incentives, change the incentive structure to where people kind of understand that, no, no, maybe, maybe we do need to be, be more responsible with our budgets? You have to be more responsible. There has to be fiscal responsibility to get out of this thing. You just can't. You you, you clearly can't spend your way out of inflation. That's just absolutely impossible. I've heard some talk about that. Well, yeah. I, but I have heard that in this building, in, in in responsible spending from both parties, Republicans and Democrats, saying, "Yeah, we don't want 2011, 12, 13 over again. You know, that those were, those were some painful times. We yeah. we want to put money away. So, do you, do you think the the legislature, the governor, have been more prudent, maybe so than more so than Congress? I don't think there's any question that they are. Uh, if you look at what we're uh, planning to do with the money that we got from the federal government, it's for, major, it's for significant projects. Uh, it's not for uh, uh, covering operations or expanding existing programs that would be a continuing, uh, uh, a would have a continuing mm -hmm. need for a, cash. A budget right? line item. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that makes sense. Uh, and I think that's, that's the way to go about it. Yeah. Well, we're out of time, but it's it's been great. I feel like I've been to an economics lesson. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> good. Well, you know, back at Auburn, but I really appreciate you coming on the program to explain to uh, folks like me who don't understand all these things and, and our viewers just these complicated but very important topics. Ex extremely important, and uh, we got to get it under control. Yeah. Well, thanks again for coming on. We look You're forward to having you again. You're welcome. Good to be here. We'll be right back. You're watching Alabama Public Television. As we reported earlier, a new statue was unveiled this week at Tuskegee University honoring the Polio Recognition Project. That was funded in part by Rotary International. Joining me from the Rotary Club is Graham Champion. Graham, thanks for coming on Capital Journal. Todd, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk about this project that we've been working on for the last three years over in Tuskegee. Well, tell me more about this. How did this get started? One of Rotary's uh, major areas of focus is the elimination of polio worldwide. And we're just that close to eliminating uh, polio. What people don't realize for the most part is that a big portion of that uh, research that led to the Salk vaccine was conducted at, Tuskegee, at then Tuskegee Institute. Uh, back in 1938, 39, uh, President Roosevelt, is, he kept going back and forth to Warm Springs, Georgia for his treatments for polio, mm -hmm. realized that African-American children had no place to be treated for the polio. It was thought that African-American children couldn't get polio. He was uh, friends with a gentleman by the name of Basil O'Connor who was chairman of the Board of Trustees at uh, Tuskegee, and uh, issued a grant to Tuskegee Institute to conduct research on how and, and build a hospital, the John A. Andrews Hospital, to treat African-American children. Uh, 
the research that was done at, at Tuskegee uh, led to the development of what is known as the HeLa cell. And the HeLa cell is uh, a cell that was the basis of the Salk vaccine. And as we all know, the Salk vaccine was what really uh, led to the eradication of polio, the prevention of polio worldwide. Uh, they uh, did this work in Tuskegee at the John A. Andrews Hospital. Uh, they treated children there for a number of years. Uh, they built their own braces for the, the children's legs on campus at Tuskegee. Hmm. Uh, and it's one of those things that is, is one of the closely held secrets, I guess, uh, that we need to talk about. Rotary, as I said, is uh, focused on eliminating polio worldwide. Right now, there are only two countries in the world that have live polio virus, uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan and less than 20 total cases in those two countries. Uh, we hope that by 2026 we can declare polio totally eradicated as we have with certain other diseases. Uh, another you know, piece of trivia, if you will, is out of the uh, Tuskegee Infantile Paralysis Institute, as it was known, uh, that was the genesis uh, for the March of Dimes. Hmm. Uh, Basil O'Connor and, and uh, President Roosevelt and a celebrity out of uh, D.C. to help raise money to fund this, this project, said, let's go to the school children and uh, have every school child bring a dime, uh, thus the March of Dimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Basil O'Connor uh, became the first uh, president, chairman uh, of the March of Dimes and served in that role for, for decades. Well, it's certainly a point of pride for our state. And uh, I know that it, you must have had partners in this in terms of you know, securing funding? Who, who all helped out with this endeavor? Well, we, we had a number of uh, private individuals that helped. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield through the Caring Foundation uh, was a major contributor. Uh, and I'd particularly like to thank Senator Billy Beasley, Senator Arthur Orr, and Representative Steve Klaus, who uh, in this last legislative session helped obtain some funding uh, for, for this project that was a major component of getting us across the line to, to make it happen. Well, we really appreciate you coming on to share more about this, and thank you for your work in this, and it's certainly something to be proud of uh, for Tuskegee University and the state of Alabama. It is, and it's, you know, hopefully we can bring some uh, positive pu publicity for the university, for uh, the city of Tuskegee, and as you said, the, the in entire state of Alabama. Absolutely, well, happy to cover it, and thank you for, for coming on to share. Thanks, Todd, appreciate it very much. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. Click on the online video tab on the main page. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. Next, I'm joined by Steve Flowers, author and political columnist here in the state of Alabama. Steve, thanks for coming on Capital Journal. Good to be with you, Todd. Thanks for inviting me. Well, I know you, you had a career as a politician, a legislator here in Alabama, uh, but now you are syndicated columnist in many newspapers statewide. How many is it now? I think it's over 60, and a lot of the online publications like you run it uh, in your Alabama today, and then um, Yellowham Political Report, those run it too. And so, uh, But it's in 60 papers, and it's not just rural papers. There are a lot of daily papers that people don't realize how big they are now. Tuscaloosa News, Dothan Eagle, Opelika, Auburn News, and a lot of those papers around the northern part of the state, around Scottsburg and the Fort Payne, those areas, pretty populous, you know, Coleman. What made you get into political commentary, analysis after your legislative career? You know, it's kind of by accident. You know, I'm from Troy, and I represented Troy in the legislature for close to 20 years, and, um, you know, in that area. Um, and I was writing a column for the Troy Messenger on uh, Alabama political history and also Troy history and Pike County history because my family has been there years and years and I knew the history. Of the anyway, it's in a chain called the Boone newspapers. Mm -hmm. A man named Boone in Tuscaloosa owns a chain of papers and Troy is in that chain and they were sending it out to other papers. Other papers got interested in it and they um, 
they came back and um, said, I like old Flowers column. I think I can I start running it. And about four or five, Andalusian, different ones started running it. And I said, well, I think there's a room. Bob Ingram had been doing a real political column sure. I'd grown, grown up reading for years. In the Advertiser, right? Or in the well, Alabama Journal. He, had about, he was syndicated about 26 papers. And um, I read him growing up my entire life. And Bob and I, I, was, I, I idolized Bob Ingram. And um, he, was a, well, he was a great political writer and political historian. Anyway, I, I said, I'm going to try to do what Bob Ingram's going to do. And Bob about retired. I said, so I went out and saw every newspaper in the state and came back with about 45, and now I'm up to 60. Uh, and not just rural papers, like I say, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in almost every paper in the state just about. Well, a lot of folks look forward to your commentary every week. And I noticed that you had a lot to say about this, this last election. There was a lot to say. It was a big one. You had, you know, top of the ticket, uh, you, uh, Katie Britt there, mm -hmm. um, really – just exceeding everybody's expectations. Well, you wrote about this. What was your? Big oh, I wrote takeaway? about it all year because it was a big story. You don't have election years every year, and I have to write, you know, historical stuff during the interim. But th the thing about this year, every year the governor's race is always a premier race. But it was a premier race in the old days, Todd, because they couldn't succeed themselves. So we'd have a good governor's race every right. four years. So this wasn't set up to be a good governor's race with Kay Ivey being inc a popular incumbent. But this Senate race was the premier race, and I knew it was going to be from the beginning because Senator Shelby is leaving the seat after 36 years. You don't have an open Senate seat, especially one held by such a powerful and uh, iconic person in the state. Uh, nobody's going to do what Shelby's done for Alabama. We could have 10 stories about that, 10 shows. But uh, I followed it closely, and, uh, you know, I've, I've, I kind of – I never endorse a candidate, but I always kind of felt like Katie Britt was the best one in that race, and I'm glad she won. Mm -hmm. uh, I think she'll do a great job. If for no other reason, Todd, she knows what she's doing, and, and she's young. I mean, the seniority system, as you know, is so entrenched in Washington that it's really 20 years before you really have some power up there, especially in the Senate. And she's got the, the ability to have that. And, and um, actually, I've known Katie uh, since she was a little girl growing up in Enterprise. I was in the legislature there in Troy and Pike County, and I'd watch Coffee County next door. And I remember her running for governor of girl state and getting elected governor of girl state when she was a junior in high school. And I looked over at Jack Hawkins, who was president of Troy University. I said, Jack, that girl has gotten has got U.S. Senator Governor written all over her. And then I followed her to become president of the SGA at the University of Alabama. And I watched her. I actually got she and Shelby introduced together. So I said, I said, Shelby, this girl's just unbelievable. She's just a perfect, perfect person for that Senate seat. Well, we'll be, be watching that. Um, and what were your thoughts about the governor's race in terms of, you know, she, here's this popular incumbent, all the polls show it, and yet these opponents run anyway. I, I mean, do you think there were some just kind of pie-in-the-sky idea? Do you think there were some consultants telling them to do this? Because it, at the end of the day, she wins by 55% without a runoff. Yeah, it was very an impressive victory. I always thought she'd win without a runoff but not 55. I thought she'd get about 50.1%. Even predicted the week before election, she'd get about 51. But you know, Kay's an unpopular governor, and she's done a good job. And people, I think, deep down knew that. The the people running against her, I just thought it was it's so futile to do that because, and especially the ones that spend a lot of their own money. Right. Uh, Lindy Blanchard spent 10, 11 million dollars of her own money and uh, got what 18 percent of the vote. And um, you know, uh, but you know, they may be thinking they're running to get acquainted race. Back in the old days, people were running to get acquainted races. Sure, sure. with thinking thinking towards the future. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I thought about Lou Burdett because he didn't have a lot of money, spend a lot of money, but he had a lot of positive message and didn't attack like the like the other. No, he did too. not, and I think that's why he was running. Um, I don't know. I didn't didn't know him as well. Did it got? I, you can't help but like Lindy Blanche if you meet her. She's a very nice lady. Um, I don't know if Tim James tries again, he's going to get in the shorty price category. I mean, he's run three times and, you know, and three times he's out, you know, so maybe he won't run again. <laughs> well, speaking about shorty price in the old days, uh, I, I enjoyed your column this week about, I guess it was a, the second in two parts, about Big Jim Folsom versus George Wallace um, in this, in this. it's not a debate, it's a, it's a two different television appearances leading up to that 1962 election. You, you can set the stage. Well, the stage was set because television had become the new medium for politics. Prior to that, Todd, it, prior to the 1960 presidential election with Kennedy 
and Nixon. It's well known in political circles. And 19, political, yeah, okay, 1960. The 60 presidential race was won with television. Kennedy beat Nixon with television. He looked young. Nixon had the sweat. Oh, yeah, yeah and Kennedy was tanned and had rested and neither the issues. So everybody knew that television had elected John Kennedy in 60. So television came to Alabama in 62. And uh, Big Jim Folsom to set the stage had been the only only two people had been governor twice. He had been elected governor, couldn't, couldn't succeed himself from 46 to 50 and from 54 to 58. He was coming back for a third term. He had a tremendous legacy. He was a little man's big friend. He was 6'9". If you put the word uninhibited in a dictionary uh, and put his picture beside it, it, it would categorize the word uninhibited. He was, he was the most uninhibited, gregarious person that ever God ever made. But you had on top of that, he liked alcohol a lot, so he stayed drunk most of his second term. Matter of fact, we're sitting down in the state house right now, and right across the street in the governor's office. The, you know, the governor's got to sign and do certain things. Some days he'd be so uh, he drunk, drunk most every day. He gets sober about one day a week, and then run around the cab and say, "He's sober today. He's sober today. Give me going to sign. We going to sign." But he came on TV drunk that night before the election, and it was it was the most colorful show. It killed him. But I end my column this week in the story, uh, Todd, by saying I don't think that Big Jim would have beaten Wallace in that 6-2 race. The race issue was just so paramount. You're too young to remember, but it was the only issue. It was segregation now, segregation today, segregation tomorrow by Wallace. He'd captured the issue, and he he, he was going to win with that race issue. Big Jim was soft on the race issue. Well, I guess this is eight years after board, uh, Brown v. Board, integration, uh, segregation is a is a huge issue, and you're right. Uh, Jim Folsom, as a progressive, was pro, uh, maybe not pro integration, but certainly not not going to oppose the Supreme Court like Wallace promised to do. That was the thing, right? They it wanted was, to that was issue. They wanted to um, mm -hmm. stand up against the Supreme Court and and defy a Supreme Court order to to integrate, and he wasn't like that. No, and, Big and, uh, Jim was. Matter of fact, Big Jim was not just soft; he was progressive. He made a speech in 1954 when he was governor. Imagine no, there were no black voters in the state. No blacks could not vote. And uh, he said the reason this state's so far behind the rest of the country is we're letting one-third of our population not be able to go to school. And, and, and he, then he asked Adam Clayton Powell, the only black congressman in the, in the Congress from Harlem, to have scotch with him in the governor's mansion. Can you imagine how that sold in Roanoke? Well, yeah, I mean, there's a great documentary about it, uh, it huh? that, that about Big Jim Folsom and all that. It, it's fascinating, and well, and we can link to it. Well, let me ask you: just do you see any? I mean, that, there were just crazy times uh, in in those elections, and so many people are were amped up over race. Um, and I'm not saying that the same issues exist. Certainly not. We're not talking about segregated schools and things like that. But you do see people really animated. Um, you know. You know really following Trump uh, in a certain sort of populist way and, and really amped up um, politically. Do you see any similarities between 62 and 2022 and the elections to come? I see a lot of uh, similarities in the rhetoric of Donald Trump and George Wallace. Yeah. I mean, Wallace really was a, was a great orator. I mean, he, was, he, he had that, that issue down, and, and there's a lot of similarities there. Uh, times have changed, so you're not going to have the overt racist stuff that Wallace and them did. Uh, you know, they can't do that, but, um, but there's some similarities. You know, more things change, the more they stay the same. Yeah. That's why I like political history so much, is because you can look back and see similarities in different races. Now, I don't see any, anybody coming on TV and with a paid 30 minute show, Drunk as Cooter Brown, <laughs> you know, like Big Jim did that night. <laughs> he, was, he was very colorful. But uh, they, it, it's, uh, it's, TV is still the medium. You can look at that election that you're talking about, this Senate race. There was a direct correlation to ads and negative ads affecting that race throughout. Mm -hmm. And the two things that prevailed is you don't ever want to get into a political race and ever be outspent or outworked. Well, Katie Britt did both of those. She outspent her opposition, thanks to Senator Shelby a good part, but uh, she also outworked both Durant and Brooks two to one. She ran circles. I, like you say, I'm in every paper in the state, these rural papers. I would see her in Roanoke, Grove Hill, Scottsboro, mm -hmm. and you didn't see Durant and Brooks there. I mean, she was going to every hamlet in the state. Well, that showed up on election night, you know, 
her, her dominance in rural counties was, was really something. Let me ask you about this. There's a lot of talk these days about, and I think they're going to vote on it this week, or the, the Republican Party will, about having closed primaries uh, rather than the open, you know, pretty much anybody can vote in, in either. Can't vote in the runoff if you vote, you know, can't change crossover during the runoff. But all this talk about it, I know the talk's been around for years. What are your thoughts about the effects that that would have on Alabama's political system? I don't know that you're going to see that welcome by the legislature to do that because uh, other states envy Alabama with an open primary. I mean, most people don't like to go in when they register to vote in maybe 35 other states. And when you register, you've got to tell that registrar you're a Republican or a Democrat. Mm -hmm. People don't necessarily like that. Uh, you know, they, they like the idea of, you know, I, I'm not really a member of either party. Most people don't belong to one party or the other. They might be conservative or they uh -huh. might be liberal, but they don't want to sign their name saying, you know, I'm this party. They may vote for every Republican on the ballot every time they go in there to vote, but they don't want to say I'm just a total Republican. Right. And the average person doesn't. When I was talking to uh, Senator Elliott about this, you know, some of these rural counties, you know, the Democrats might still be in charge like you might have a sheriff in Lowndes County right you know he's got to run as a Democrat but but needs Republicans to to support him or mm -hmm. something like that and he he brought up the idea that maybe um, if they did these closed primaries they would still allow independence which I guess that's really not truly closed but anyway it's an interesting issue to watch most people are independents so if you make it harder for them to go in there and, and say well now you voted in the Democratic primary five years ago you can't it's gonna cause all kind of contest Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to, I mean, somebody who loses the Republican primary is going to go in there and say, well, Joe Smith on Maple Street went over and voted in the, Repu in the Democratic primary five years ago. He can't vote. Well, the guy may have become a Republican. Right. And who's to you say? Know, you know? Well, while I've got you, um, legislature is not going to meet for a while, coming back in March, unless there's a special, but probably in March. We always talk about the issue of gambling coming up. You're talking about, we talk about it every year. Um, it's going to be a new legislature, though, with plenty of new faces, probably at least 25 new faces. Um, what do you see of the prospects there? Do you, do you see Governor Ivey and the legislature trying to tackle that issue again, or do you think it's going to take some more time? I have not visited with Governor Ivey about that issue. Uh, I think it takes the governor being adamantly for it, and I almost think you've got to do it in a special session. Kind of like the roads. Yeah, like the roads. She's got to get behind it, not as adamant as she was about the roads, but she was pretty strong about that, but just a special session. And, and the reason it will pass the legislature is they've got four years to run. You're only, you're only not, you're not alienating just a few people because the, the reluctance to vote on that issue for moral reasons against gambling is almost gone because the average person realizes we've got gambling in the state. We're just not getting any revenue from it. When these Powerball lotteries come around, Todd, I get the most people all over the state saying, why in the world are we letting that money go to other states? That's why people in my age group, in my category, who may not ever buy a lottery ticket will be the first ones to buy, sign up to vote for the full gambling thing and vote for approval. It'll pass 65% if it gets on the ballot. Uh, and well, it'll pay us 65 percent, and that will give K. Ivy a legacy too, because if they'll save some of that money that they get from that from the gaming, like Fob James did with the offshore oil money. See, Fob James got a legacy, but they, they rely on that oil money uh, for the Al general fund, Alabama trust fund, uh, yeah. Alabama trust fund. That was a wise, prudent decision. That and if, if they do something like that. Uh, I don't know the road's going to give her an issue, going to give her a legacy. If she doesn't, if she doesn't do this, th th it's just a shame, and Alabamians are really upset about it, that their money is going to Mississippi, Georgia, Tennessee, and Florida. Well, certainly an issue to watch as the legislature, well, uh, brand new legislature, brand new term. Steve, thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. 
World War II era Tuskegee Airmen were the first African-American pilots in U.S. military service. Because Tuskegee was the only training facility for black pilots in the United States during World War II, potential pilots came from all over the country. The first African-American flying unit was the 99th Fighter Squadron, which deployed in the spring of 1943. The 99th earned a distinguished unit citation flying missions against enemy targets over Italy. The second flying unit, the 332nd Fighter Group, flew several successful bomber escort missions throughout the war. Its P-51 fighters had distinctively painted red tails, earning the unit and its planes the nickname Red Tails. In 1948, President Truman issued an executive order mandating the racial integration of all military services. The way was paved by the Tuskegee Airmen of World War II, and in 2007, President Bush collectively awarded them a Congressional Gold Medal. Before we go, I wanted to follow up on the unclaimed property thing that uh, Treasurer Young Boozer was talking about earlier. As he was leaving, he showed me the site, and we looked up my name on the unclaimed property uh, portal. To my surprise, there was more than $500 in my name from things like uncashed paychecks and credit card rebates and things like that. So you might want to check out the unclaimed property on the treasurer's website. Okay, that's our show for tonight. Thanks for watching. We'll be right back next Friday night at 7.30 right here on Alabama Public Television. For our Capital Journal team, I'm Todd Stacy. We'll see you next time.